This is a follow-up video to the Will It Run where I got this 1970 Arctic Cat Panther going and it got going a little bit you know, on the snow. For those of you that watched that last video, one of the things that we talked about was that the high packs were entirely shot on that snowmobile. So one of the things that uh, we're going to address now is that I do have some new high packs for it and we're going to go ahead and go through the steps to put this high packs on. Uh, one other thing I'll throw out is one of these days, a couple weeks ago, I went to go ahead and start it up again just for the heck of it. And I gave a nice pull on the starter cord and you can all see, you know, what happened. You know, I, I would ask for a raise of hands to see who was surprised by this, but nobody should be surprised that the starter cord on this 50 year old snowmobile, 52 year old snowmobile went ahead and broke. So we'll go ahead and, and take a look at that as well and get this thing up and going. So one of the things I'll throw out here too in this video is that I have a lot of background noise. The wind is blowing like crazy. So I'll try to forgive the background noise. Um, to that end, I guess I asked this question is, do you know why the, blo the wind blows so hard in Montana? It's because North Dakota sucks. So just, just kidding out there. Just having some good natured fun for anybody that might be watching this from North Dakota. So another thing that people might be wondering is it's already toward mid-April. Why are you spending any time trying to work on this snowmobile now? We actually have a spring storm that's supposed to be coming up, I believe, Monday, Tuesday this next week. And we're supposed to get between 8 and 12 inches of snow. Now it's going to be that really, really wet stuff and it's not going to last very long. But I want to try to get this going in case it sticks around for a day or so give my kids a chance to, to ride this before you know the rest of spring and then of course summer comes. So stay uh, in touch with me through the rest of the video and let's see if we get some stuff fixed. So let's take a look at this recoil starter real quick. I went ahead and, and pulled it off and one of the reasons of course to pull it off is you need to see how long you know a rope you need for it. You never quite know where these things might break. Seems like a lot of times they'll break toward the end but you, you, I, I don't know exactly what the length of this thing should be and so I went ahead and, and tore it apart and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not but now is an interesting time to maybe take a look at how this thing works uh, my earlier video I said it kind of works almost like a, a, a set of brake drums you can see when this spins this way that it go ahead and it expands that out and of course in a normal position it's like that so there's these little shoes here, I'm going to call them on the outside, and when you pull on it, it goes to the position where it expands them outwards, and then I'll show you what it looks like where it goes. When those shoes expand, of course they expand against you know, the inside of what I'm going to call this drum, and that's actually what goes ahead and, and spins it. So when I'm looking at this, and I've kind of been rotating it a little bit by hand, uh, it seems like it's rotating a lot rougher than I remember it pulling over. What I think is probably the case is I think this broke off, you know, so there's a stub in there with the knot, and I think it's kind of probably jamming up in there somewhere, so this isn't going to be as easy as I thought it might be. So I'm going to probably go ahead and take this apart. You can see, take a snap ring plier to pull this whole Castromus assembly off of there, and then uh, we'll go ahead and and try to see how long that stub of rope is in there so I can get some rope that's the right length. I'll have to be a little bit careful because I will tell you that there is a big spring in here and that's wound inside. You can kind of see it a little bit. And I don't know about this recoil one, but some of these, if you pull them apart, if you don't do it the right way, it's pretty easy to spring the spring. And once you do that, it can really be a bear cat to get that back together. So we want to be really careful when you take these things apart so that that spring, you know, uh, stays in, in the right spot there and doesn't come undone because, like I said, it really stinks. So we'll go ahead and dig in this a little bit deeper. Hey, remember I told you to be very, very careful taking that whole assembly out of there so the spring doesn't go spring? Well, yeah, as you can see, it's not supposed to look like that. I then screwed it up. So now it's going to be one of those things where we're going to have to figure out how it all works. I went ahead and laid out these different parts and pieces as I took them off, you know, to try to keep everything together. Um, you can see here 
on the, I'm going to call it the recoil assembly. That tang that sticks out about at the end of my thumb there, that's where the spring hooks onto, you know, provide the uh, preload, I guess, to make it all work. Um, I expected when I pulled it all apart that I was going to find some sort of chunk of rope in there and I do not see it. So I think it broke right there at the knot, which means that if I want to, I guess I could retie a knot and probably use it. Or, you know, maybe it's a good idea to look at the rest of the rope and still replace it. Anyway, so that sucks. <laughs> if I would have known that it was uh, right at the end there, which I should have guessed it, I could have done this without trying to take that all apart. But now, here we are. So let me fight and cuss at this thing for a while, try to get it in the right position, and then I'll, uh, I'll show you more once I get there. All right, a little hard to see, but I do have that spring kind of put back together. I think more or less what it looked like. Uh, I need to figure out exactly, you know, how that all goes in there. So if we take a look at what's inside, it's pretty grimy and nasty. I'm going to go ahead, clean up the inside of that case, and then I'm going to play with it to see how that spring goes in there. It's always a treat to try to fix something when you don't really have an idea how it came apart and how exactly it's supposed to go back together. I think this is it. Uh, that one hook that you can see right there, I, I remember seeing it and it definitely was a piece that hooked onto there. I remember being able to see it through that window when it was all together. So I, I know that that hook has to be toward the middle just by taking a look at it. Uh, that end piece, I'm not so sure about that. You know, I can see this cutout here. There was a semblance of a hook. Uh, that's the best I can tell for right now how it maybe goes together. Uh, how do you how do you wind these back together? There, there's really no super great way. Uh, I try to find the cleanest spot I can. Just kind of let the spring just totally unwind itself. And then basically you start on the outside there. And then of course you just kind of start working it in a circle and, and working it, you know, in there uh, layer by layer until you get to this point. So what we will do now is we'll go ahead and we'll take that piece and we will drop it in there and make sure that hook lines up in the hook of the spring. And then we'll kind of start working around a little bit and see if it acts like it's going to work or not. So wish me luck. Let's see if I can show this without it getting away from me. So if we can see in there, maybe you can see that it is hooked around there. And then if I go ahead and, and turn this, it engages the spring. It acts like I'll be able to wind it up and it's gonna go ahead and provide me recoil. So I think that's gonna go ahead and work. We'll put the rest of the stuff on it and then we'll go ahead and I'm going to take a quick look at the rope. I'm very tempted just to reuse it. And I know a lot of people out there are cringing saying, no, Adam, don't be an idiot. Don't do it. I, I, I might do it. <laughs> we'll see. So one of the things to know on these recoil starters, if you, of course, just leave it in this natural position, and if you go ahead and put the rope in there, which I know is tempting to do if you're a first timer, guess what? It's not going to recoil. So you got to put some preload on it. And if I remember right, I think the rule of thumb on these is roughly three turns of preload. And then you got to hold it in that spot. And then you go ahead and run your rope in there, uh, tie your knot, and then go ahead and let that let it loose. And it'll go ahead and it'll, it'll pull it back in. And then you can go ahead and, uh, and get your handle set in the right spot. For this style of starter, it shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, because of the way those shoes and things are and, and how they rotate out the length of the rope I don't think is near as important as some of the later model uh, Recoil starters, so I'm gonna go take a good look at that rope Like I said tempted to just reuse it and we'll try to get this thing back together Oh My goodness that wind is blowing like crazy out there So I'm looking at my rope right now and I want to show you the super scientific way on how you can test this rope to see if you should reuse it. You just kind of do a couple of these 
And, oh geez, you know, it's feeling pretty good, looking pretty good for a good reason. One of the things, uh, the end of it is frayed a little bit here, so just to make it easier to thread in there, we're going to go ahead and burn the ends of this. And that'll make it easier so we can go ahead and get it there through the hole and uh, into the recoil spot there. And we are about ready to go. Okay, I got my three turns of preload put in there. I tied one of the finest figure eight knots that man's ever seen and went ahead and pulled it back in there. Uh, it could be just a little bit better. Maybe I should went four turns of preload. I think we'll be okay. We'll give her a try. That's something that's easy enough to redo if I need to here in the future. We'll go ahead and try it. Uh, I gotta look at my knot. Seems like it, yeah, we'll just make sure it doesn't stick up too much. Might need to squeeze her flat with a pair of pliers or do something just to make sure there's good clearance in there. Uh, that figure eight knot shouldn't pull through or anything like that so i think we're pretty good shape so we're gonna go ahead and put this thing back on and maybe we'll see if she fires up again before i go do that hi fax we can't go ahead and get that starter put together and not try to start it can we so last time i made that video probably about a month ago and it hasn't been started since then of course the starter rope was broken so let's go ahead and just see if this beast will go ahead and fire up Turn her on. We turn on the work it. We'll get that tilt turned on. We'll give her a squirt of fuel from the primer there. We'll give her a little open throttle. dig a little bit deeper into this. It almost acts like it's not getting spark or something. So I'm gonna go ahead and dink with this one. I guess it's not a one pull ripper anymore. You'll never believe it. I went ahead and, and cut the clip so I could spend more time looking at it. I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and take the choke off and I'll give it one more pull before I go deeper. And it actually started on that very first pull where I didn't have the choke on. So let's see if we can fire it back up again for everybody. Not use choke or anything, we're just gonna pull her. super duty figure eight knot guaranteed not to pull through thing uh well the reason it wasn't coming back in all the way is looky there that figure eight knot went ahead and pulled through which is interesting so what we're gonna go ahead and do there is that i'll go ahead and use a pick tool see if i can get that knot pulled back out so i can undo it and then we'll go ahead and we'll put a washer in there something so we can uh, go ahead and, and try to make it so we don't lose the dang thing so let me see what we can do we got our starter problem fixed and in fantastic shape so what's next on this high fact side of it well we're gonna have to go ahead and drop the track out of it so we're gonna have to take out those bolts there that are at the back and then we're gonna have to also take out those bolts that are at the front and of course those are on each side I think if I if I think right, <laughs> I think with those four bolts, this whole track assembly will just drop out 
So we're going to go ahead and we'll take a board and we'll put underneath that heavy duty hitch right there. And I'll go ahead and take out these back two bolts first. And I'll go ahead and get that board underneath it. And then we'll go ahead and put the back end of this thing up in the air. That'll allow the back part of the track to kind of drop down. And then we'll go ahead and undo those front bolts. And then we should be able to, I think, just kind of scoot that skid forward a little bit. Well, even the track, you know, still engaged in the drivers and stuff up front and go ahead and probably just pull that skid assembly out the side after we wrestle with it with uh, brute force and awkwardness. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, see what I can do here. And hopefully when you see this next, I will have the skid out. Those back bolts were really easy. In that last video, we went ahead and when we put this back together after... Uh, Taking a look at stuff down there, we went ahead and I seized it, and that makes all the difference in the world. So, of course, the front bolts there, boy, the last time they were out, who the heck knows? Maybe 1970? <laughs> I, I don't know. So we'll go ahead and get those out first. But here is that board, you know, in the back, underneath the hitch, and uh, that'll go ahead and keep us elevated and uh, allow us to be able to drop that skid out nice and easy but that's the hope anyway all right we got all the bolts out those front ones definitely had not been out in a very long time just trying to see if there's a reason why it's not coming out my video is hard to see at this point but it doesn't look like there's anything more here than just getting a pry bar or a well-placed kick or something like that to go ahead and uh, get that skid dropped out but what do my wandering eyes see? Remember our factory lift kit on the back that we talked about where we put it on that factory drop bracket? I see one on the front too. So guess what? When we put this back together, we're gonna go ahead and drop the front of this skid at the same spot. And then if we thought it was mountain sled ready before, it's definitely mountain sled ready after this. That is some state of the art, 1970. Suspension technology right in front of your eyes. So once we went ahead and got our, the bolts out, got it elevated up, just a little bit of wiggling around and things like that. And then of course the whole skid drops down. Then you can usually slide the skid forward a little bit and then just kind of work the track over it and then pull it out the side. I know some people go ahead and put a snowmobile on their side to go ahead and do it. I typically just try to elevate them like this if at all possible. So I'll get this in a spot where I can take a little better look at it and I'll get her flipped over and we'll see what's left of that Hyfax. That existing Hyfax crumbled away bad. That first ride we just took, you know, I took a quick loop. I mean, it's a very small loop. My kids did the same. That just got super brittle and broke off there. As far as did we do any damage on that little ride? I don't think so. I don't really see anywhere on that skid. We just got some old rivets. We can either drill it or grind off or whatever. And then we'll go ahead and work at getting our new Hyfax on there. And we'll be good as new. Here's a skid after getting all the rivets out. There were some of those Hyfax pieces that had broken. And we took that little ride, of course, with them broken off. It went ahead and kind of rounded off some of the rivets and ground them down a little bit and a few different things like that. So I was able to use, of course, a drill bit to get most of them. I used basically a cutoff wheel to get some of the others, a combination using a center punch and a drill bit. Uh, 3 16ths is a hole that's in the skid there. I went ahead and just scuffed it with a scotch bite real quick. And I think we're ready to put that Hyfax on there. The Hyfax at the, the front here takes a pretty good bend. And so what I've heard is that you should go ahead and start riveting it. And then use a heat gun and rivet as you go so that you can go ahead and make that bend. Uh, also important to see that you should use 3 16 steel rivets to put this all together. I just don't think the aluminum is strong enough. So we're going to go ahead and start attacking this and see what happens. I have heard that some of this aftermarket Hyfax maybe doesn't 100% fit right and may have to drill some additional holes in the skid. I guess we'll see when we get there if that's a thing or not. I got the first Hyfax on and it's been a little bit 
interesting. It's been a lot more labor intensive than I thought it was going to be. So some of the things that I had read and, and looked at and uh, looked at the holes in the the skid frame as well looked like it all led to 3 16 rivets and of course you're supposed to use steel rivets and so no, no reason to question that. So I went and uh, got some 3 16 steel rivets there from Ace and when I was looking at them, I could tell that those rivets had a quite a bit bigger head on them than what I would consider, you know, like a standard type rivet. Let me just give an example of that. You can see holes here, you know, that was supplied in the high fax for what I'd call a standard size rivet. And then you can see the size of rivets that I have here. So uh, since the head's bigger, you know, I went ahead and thought, well, maybe I'll just go ahead and grind heads down those rivets. That... I did a couple of them. It was going to be a really time-consuming deal. So I went ahead and I found a 5 8 bit and I went and set the depth of my drill press and went ahead and, and drilled some there to countersink them just so those rivets would fit in there. So, you know, that, that seemed okay. Uh, I went ahead and started here at the front. They I have seen where people say to go ahead and maybe use some heat to make this curve. I was looking for my heat gun and I don't know where it's at to tell you the honest truth. So I went ahead and started and then just kind of slowly clamped and wrapped and riveted and, and it seemed to bend fairly nice. So no huge concerns there. After I got about, oh, I don't know, four or five rivets done with just my standard, you know, crappy light duty riveting tool like we probably all have. It was going to be a pain in the behind to do 40 316 steel rivets in that manner. So I went ahead and I went and bought me a new air rivet gun and boy it is super nice. So for anybody that is going to do some level of riveting, the air is definitely where it is at. So besides it taking a lot longer time, it seems to be going okay. But one of the things too I'd, I'd seen as a review on this Hyfax when I bought it, said all the holes may not line up. The holes here at the front seemed like they lined up good and seemed like it was pretty good till about halfway through, I suppose. And then once I started getting toward the back, the holes just weren't really lined up all that good. So then I went ahead and used a center punch and drilled some new holes there in the frame to go ahead and uh, you know get it so I could rivet it down. So right now, I think it's looking okay. Taking way longer than I thought, but I think the finished product's gonna end up being okay, especially once it gets pushed underneath there and you get track on it, you'll never notice any difference. So I'm gonna go ahead and tackle that other side. I thought it might be worthwhile to show how I'm starting this thing. So I'm happen to start in the second hole. And so I have my rivet, you know, in there, I have it lined up. I put a clamp on each side of this. And so I'll go ahead and take my rivet gun. I'll go ahead and pull that down tight. And then I'll go ahead and use these two clamps and I'll slowly just start working this thing around the curve. You know, like I mentioned earlier, I think a little bit of heat probably would work, but it didn't seem too bad the first time. I slowly worked around with those clamps and it seemed to work pretty good. But the first time that I didn't try, you know, this clamp on both sides and I was using my hand riveter, it, uh, it didn't grab very good and I ended up having to start over and I tried to start on the end hole too. So I don't know if the second hole is the best place to start or not, but it seemed like it's working pretty good for me. So there's that skid with the uh, Hyfax on on both sides. Excuse the mess, I kind of work in chaos a lot of the times. So that second one went on way faster. You know how it usually goes, you figure out how to do it the first time, and then the second time goes quicker. I think it turned out, you know, fairly good for the most part. I will tell you, I think my new favorite tool for today is that air rivet gun. What a nice way to put something like that together. My hands would have been cramping, you know, big time if I would have had to bend, you know, trying to put all them steel rivets in with that little rivet tool. Skid is in position and ready to go back underneath the sled here. So I'm going to just go ahead and kind of describe what's going to happen. It's going to be basically the same as what you did to take it out of there. And of course, <laughs> you're putting it back together now. You don't want to see me doing this. It might be Bunch of grunting, maybe a little bit of cussing, all sorts of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, just kind of do your best to kind of work it in there. Don't get too frustrated. Um, kind of keep it worked forward a little bit. That'll keep some good slack there in your track. 
And then uh, once I get it in position with the track over it, I'll probably either use some blocks or maybe a jack or something like that to kind of start jacking in position so we can try to get them bolt holes lined up. So you're going to have fun with the clips fighting you and various things and just keep working it. Go from one side, go to the next. Lift a little bit here, lift a little bit there, see your obstructions are. And when you get it to that spot, you, you'll know when it's the right spot. It'll go ahead and the high packs will just kind of sit down in that groove on the track and everything, you know, sits nice and easy. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and take that 2x4 out. We'll slowly lower the sled down, probably all the way. I'll get my floor jack in position underneath that back bumper and then we got some adjustment then over our height. And we'll go ahead and start working at trying to finesse and try to get our bolts in. So at this point I got some pry bars and screwdrivers and a punch and various things just to assist with this whole thing. And once again, don't get too big a hurry. It'll uh, fight you a little bit, but it'll work in the long run. The skid is now in. So it took a little bit of wiggling, a little bit of prying back and forth. You can kind of see there's that turnbuckle type arrangement. I did struggle a little bit with the back there, getting it lined up. So I went ahead and loosened up that turnbuckle. I think that's what adjusts the, the you know track pressure or how much on the track, how much on the skis. So once I loosen that up, then the back mounting point moved better and was able to get in position and move the jack come down a few times, all that sort of fun stuff, and went right back together. So here we are. Uh, you know, I think we're about ready to go with this thing. You know, there's a couple things that I will touch on that didn't happen in the first video. Uh, some of you may have noticed, maybe not, the gas gauge was totally busted out, broken, nasty. So I found an aftermarket one there. Uh, it's not quite as long as the factory one, so even though it shows E, it does have a little bit of gas. So it's nice to at least have that covered up. Uh, one of the things that I had to address is that first time we rode it, even just that little bit, the brakes really weren't working at all. Kind of interesting arrangement there, you can kind of see the lever and there's kind of a button and as you get the right view here as you pull it it kind of moves that lever and it kind of cams you know the shoe against here uh, basically all I had to do there was pretty easy just loosen up or take the cotter pin out tighten that nut up just a little bit so now my brakes work as well and I think this thing is ready to go go ahead and throw the hood down on it and so as we talked about it's getting to be oh, i don't know 9th 10th of april and uh, we're expected to actually get a snowstorm over the next couple days where we're supposed to get maybe up to nine inches of snow and it seems like a lot of effort for me to work on this sled because if this snowstorm doesn't happen it's just gonna be sitting here all summer with nothing going but i hopefully it will snow enough for the kids to be able to take a ride and uh, we'll be able to get this thing you know all wrapped up all right here's a thundering herd we're gonna go take a quick little ride in the pasture so it's april 13th we got about a foot of snow although it settled quite a bit today so we got my 2003 viper with an 835 big four kit we got the mighty 1970 articat panther with the 303 rotary and then just to round it all out, we got the 2009 Articat M1000. So here's what that M1000 looks like next to that 1970 Panther. That Panther looks pretty mean when you look at it in that group. So I'll probably throw my wife on the M1000, I'll probably ride the Viper, and we'll get two of the kids on that Panther. Look at that powerful machine carved through the powder like a gazelle. No, not a gazelle. It's a panther. So this is a good thing for these kids. Once again, that last time they went, they really didn't have an opportunity to really do much with it. So we're, not, we're going to run out of daylight tonight as well, but we'll get a little bit of time in here. Maybe we'll get something over the next day or two as well. Here they are. They're making the corner. They're on the home stretch. Here they come. Big powder in April. Spring riding. Woo! Get a drift. Here they come. Here they come. Like high 
Thanks for being a part of this journey on getting this old sled up and going over these two different times. It's been a lot of fun to work on it. Um, as far as total cash outlay, I mean, the sled was given to me free from the in-laws. I probably have, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks into it and uh, quite a bit of time, but it's been a fun time nonetheless. I think the kids had a lot of fun there being able to take it around. And uh, probably the last ride of the year, unless we try to take advantage of the next couple days. So this thing's just probably going to get put in the corner here for the summer and hopefully we'll get some good use out of it next winter. So appreciate everybody for viewing and hope you got some entertainment value out of it. Thanks.